Hello and welcome to the channel. Today I'm very excited to be exploring the concept of the philosophy of leisure and examining whether our current notion of a work-life balance is a lie. Or at least a poor philosophical understanding of what it is to work and be at rest and what it is to be a human and create things of value. And I think this topic is very interesting and timely today because so many of us are struggling with our relationship to work. We feel the grind of a nine to five. So many people are jumping ship and trying to create their own businesses. The word entrepreneur is a huge buzzword. We want to have control of our lives and there's this real dissatisfaction running through our relationship with work. So I was excited to dig into this concept a little bit. And specifically, I'm looking at the writings and ideas of a German philosopher named Joseph Pieper, who had a lot to say on the subject and specifically what he had to say in a book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture. So he had a very different understanding of what it is to have leisure in your life and why it's so, so important. So I wanna break down some of the ideas he presents in that book and find if there are ways we can shift our mindset a little bit in order to bring more light and meaning and energy into our lives and our work. So if that sounds interesting to you, stick around. We're going to get into it. So Pieper was writing and living in post-World War II Germany, and he was very dissatisfied with the definition there, with the basic understanding of what it was for something to have value. And I would argue their definition then was pretty much the same one we have in our society today, which was that for something to be valuable or worth pursuing, it should either bring you money, a greater sense of power or control in your life, or some form of entertainment. And I think that holds pretty true today. Usually those are the things we're pursuing especially in any professional sense. And he felt this was a very, very narrow understanding of what it was to be a person and do valuable things in the world. Another reason I'm drawn to this philosopher was that he was a great advocate of the liberal arts. He saw such value and beauty in what music and dance and theater and visual arts had to bring us in our daily lives. So his teachings really resonate with me because I love the arts. So he defines work as either handwork, so maybe craftsmanship or manual labor, or intellectual work, so any kind of coming up with new ideas that would benefit society overall. And he combines these into what he called total work. And he was very averse to total work because he saw it as diminishing the human person down to simply a function of society, meaning that your value as an individual was based on what you produced. So if you were not producing things in a working economy, you had no value. And actually, I think this is interesting because it also ties into something I think we see a lot today, which is that very many, probably the majority of our basic jobs that you can just snatch up off the market are artless jobs. In the last hundred years or so, we've moved far away from the artisan economy we used to have, where so much of the work was done by craftsmen who were very, very skilled and did very deliberate, very good work, right? And we can feel that value. And there's a craving for it and kind of a moving back to it today. And this notion that I've, I mentioned in a previous video as well, that to do good work, we all need to be artists in some way. And you don't have to consider yourself a painter or a dancer to be an artist. It means you take great pride, you take great value in your work. And so much of what we do today is, is based on these large corporations where you're a little cog in a machine and no one is expecting greatness or artistry or deep value from you. Your work isn't calling on your value as a person overall. It's a very limited idea of what work is. Are you providing value to society in this one specific minute way? If so, Congratulations, you belong here. You have meaning, you have value. And if you're not doing this specific task that we've assigned you, you're not serving a purpose. So there is this underlying philosophical notion for many of us in our daily experience of work that is undermining our humanity. That's what he was arguing for. He was saying, this is too narrow. It doesn't support the human person. And this, get ready, I thought this was fascinating. He references the way people used to think about work and leisure in the high middle ages. And he says for them, there was actually a tie, like they saw a connection between a kind of hyper overworking mentality, so someone was going to be a workaholic, this way of being, and idleness, that the two actually went together because they both came from having a lack of will 
to truly accomplish something that they had this different idea of what an accomplishment and what achievements were and that they came from like a deeply human place. And so that if you were spinning off in tons of mindless work or sitting idle and not doing anything, in either case, it came from this lack of connection to yourself as a person, this lack of willingness to really honor your dignity as a person and what it was you were called to do in existing and living and that your value and your good work were like linked in the same way so that lots of mindless endless working was not a good thing it was not a remedy to idleness it actually came from kind of the same mistaken understanding of what it was to do good work so that in either case man was kind of dropping his responsibility to really fulfill his potential as a human person. So we get to the kind of the crux of what Peeper's talking about here is the idea that leisure is a condition of the soul. Well, that's big. He says that the opposite of this kind of listless despair, this kind of feeling no meaning in our work, no interest in contributing, the opposite of that is not industrious effort, but actually a cheerfulness in regard to one's own existence. Uh, wow, okay, so great. How do I do that? How do I just feel cheerful in the face of my own existence? He's going really deep here. It's a big call. So he goes on to break down what leisure is by looking at how we define work and saying that leisure is the opposite of that. And he does this in three ways. He says that work in his definition of total work, this kind of negative understanding of work, he says that work must be an activity, it must require effort, and it must serve a social function. So then he looks at leisure as the opposite of those three things. So first, the idea of leisure as non-activity. Leisure as anything that is not active, okay. So leisure is when we take time for listening. It has to do with getting in touch with a more contemplative way of being. So you can think of leisure, right? If you were just anytime you maybe sit and listen to the stream or the common phrase of stop and smell the roses, but actually that would be a leisure activity. It's having an attitude of openness and surrender. So as opposed to active work where we're really participating, we're trying to control things and make sure they come out a certain way. He says leisure is the opposite of that. It's a letting go, it's a being open, it's a really listening and being aware. And it makes sense if we're, if the goal is to have some kind of joy or cheerfulness with our place in the world, that we need time to listen and take in what our role in the world is to kind of just be a part of existence sometimes. And this is a very interesting point as well, that this ability to kind of be open and listen and accept as opposed to being driven and controlling more, which can be a useful thing. I'm not saying we shouldn't have ambition and shouldn't try to get things done. That's different. Not, that's not the goal here. But to say that this attitude of openness and listening is necessary for us to be like, full, happy people who also contribute very well in society. There's also the point to be made that having an openness and a real listening is necessary not only for creating art, but for participating in and enjoying the arts. I don't know if you've ever gone, I have, if you've ever gone to see some performance and all you could do the whole time was criticize it and think about like how awful it was. I'm super guilty of that. I love doing that. I love criticizing everyone. Uh, it's <laughs> very satisfying. It makes me feel quite smart and superior, but that's not an attitude for actually getting anything from the art. And it's true. When I go and maybe listen to a symphony or see a ballet in that frame of mind, I, I don't take anything out of it in a deep sense. I take ideas, I take intellectual analysis, but it hasn't like reached into my soul or given me a deep leisurely experience like the arts are ultimately meant to do. So it's not to say that leisure is always literally sitting and being still like meditation. Meditation ties in with leisure, absolutely. It's a part of it. Or sitting still and listening to the birds. Yes, that's part of it too. But it can be more active. It can be even going to the movies, I would argue, can be an experience of leisure if you're open. If you're only looking for entertainment, you have this box, you're gonna check the box. Oh good, I went to relax for a couple hours and watch a movie. That's not the same thing as going to let some piece of like arts or creative work really like enter into your being and kind of change your ways of thinking and feeling and existing as a person. This is the idea of leisure as non-activity, as an openness and a receiving. If we have work as effort, we have leisure as sort of this attitude of celebration, a kind of openness and joy in the world around us and within our experiences. And he gets very flowery and very philosophical. He talks about how we need to be in harmony with ourselves and with the world around us. And it's really easy to say, okay, 
great. How do I be in harmony with the world around me? But he has this specific quote that I, I really like that I think is helpful. He says that leisure lives on affirmation. Leisure lives on affirmation. So this idea of really resting and really being human and in touch with ourselves is very affirming. So if leisure is the opposite of the effort involved for work, then it is this kind of like resting and receiving and affirming the world around us and being affirmed ourselves in our own role within society and where we exist. So that's the second one, this idea of leisure is separate from effort. But then the third one almost throws in a curveball because we have work as a form of social function and he says leisure does not serve work. It does not serve a specific social function. And what's interesting here is where he really differentiates leisure from a rest because he says a br taking a break, taking a rest is actually a concept that is designed to serve work. So we take a break so that we can get a little bit refreshed in order to go do more work. So he's saying this was designed in order to serve the social function of work. So leisure must be different than taking a break in order to do more work. It literally has to serve no social function in order to be leisure, or at least the goal cannot be to serve a social function. It may happen to as well, but it doesn't desire to. Yeah, so taking a break, taking a vacation, he says these are not inherently leisurely. They can be, but leisure is outside of this entire framework. So if it overlaps with some of the things we already have in our lives, that's great. It doesn't have to. It may or it may not. It doesn't necessarily make it leisure. He says that leisure is not about being free from troubles, but about being fully human. And this, I think, is fascinating. It implies that one can suffer to some extent and still experience leisure. Like you can suffer and be at peace with your role in the world. You can't really be suffering and be resting and getting ready for more work, right? Anytime we're going through a really painful time, we're going to do less productive work. It's pretty much guaranteed. We're not, we're not at our best mentally or physically, and we're not able to give back to society the same way. And our modern notion of work and value suggests that when we are wounded, when we're taken down, that implies that we are less valuable because we're not contributing as much to society. And Pieper's definition here really undercuts that and suggests that, of course, our existence is just as valuable even if we are suffering because we have this inherent dignity in who we are and that inherent to leisure is the ability to get in touch with that reality. And that's what brings us this kind of peace and joy in our working or resting sort of overall throughout. And then he has this quote that I really love. It's very striking and a little wordy. He says, the condition of utmost exertion is more easily to be realized than the condition of relaxation and detachment, even though the latter is effortless. So he's saying even though theoretically it takes no effort in order to rest and be open and receive, it's still harder for us to do. We would rather just give ourselves a ton of tasks to accomplish because at least it's clear. Like give me a to-do list, let me check it off, let me increase the numbers in my bank account. I can see the value increasing as I put in effort. It makes sense to me. Whereas this kind of like relax and be open and take time to be a part of the universe and be in tune with your role in the world and who you are, that's <laughs> very intangible, right? Really hard to get our hands on. And so something that we tend to overlook and not lean into, but so important for understanding who we are and what our place is in the world and then finding satisfaction in everything we experience and being able then to find greater grace and joy even in the midst of suffering and difficulties. And there's a really interesting commentary to be had on the nature of our schools today. And if you trace back the Greek word for leisure, which... I cannot pronounce, and move it to the Latin word for scola, right? So leisure leads to scola, leads to our current English word school. Then it's clear that schools inherently back or back, 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 a school used to be a place that was a haven of leisure. The goal used to be to encourage students to be much more in tune with themselves in reality. And from there, you would move to a place where you were contributing to society. So it was very much focused on the individual. Today, we've kind of flipped that 
backwards. And we think that the goal first and foremost is to put out positive output into society. And hopefully that will like tell us who we are as people, like our identity is our job kind of a thing. But it's, it's really very backwards. And you can see how our schools feel very industrialized. And there's this focus on conformity. We are trying to make everybody meet the same standards, fit into kind of the same cookie cutter box. And so that they can fit a very like particular little spot in society. And it's not really surprising to me that this makes us feel dissatisfied because all of us are not going to be very good at doing the same thing because we're very different people. We're created very individually. And I think it's hard for us today because we live in a certain society with underpinning philosophies. It's hard for us to break out of that. But if we can kind of deliberately look at this and kind of take a step back and think, how do I want to engage with work and with my role in society and where do I believe my value comes from, that can be very liberating and it can make a huge difference. Because then I don't mean to imply in any way that work is a negative thing, that we should not be trying to make a living or putting money in the bank. Those are important things. And I love to work and I think quite a bit about how effective am I, how efficient are my tasks being done. But at the end of the day, I, I know that my value doesn't lie in there, which is a great relief because uh, I'm often not very successful at some of the tasks I put myself to do. It often goes very badly and it's so important that we have a sense of value independent of that and independent of what cog we might be in this machine of society and productivity. So that's what I have for you today. I hope you found it interesting and that maybe it gave you some really good food for thought and hopefully we'll even unlock some doors and help you find a little bit more freedom in your life. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you're interested in this content or you want to hear me talk every week about something interesting that I think relates to how we can live fuller, more human, a little more real lives, go ahead and subscribe. I get into one of those every week. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.